So now Corey Fung will take us through ethics of genetic engineering, designer babies, and the reproductive revolution. Take it away, Corey. Thank you, Dr. Soas. All right, so I wanted to begin with why ethics? In this class, we're always concerned about the emerging technologies. Ethics, for me, is so important because ethics is more than looking at right and wrong. Ethics helps us understand when we're actually taking science too far. So, I have two learning objectives, and it's going to be the breakdown of this discussion. There is a brief description of reproductive technologies and designer babies, and then I will be looking at the ethical implications that surround each field. So, what is the reproductive revolution? It is the freedom of the choice in reproductive methods, so people can choose to reproduce sexually, asexually, um, through synthetic means. Uh, and hopefully by the end of the reproductive revolution, the idea is that we will have complete control over the human reproductive cycle. And because of that, we will be able to determine exactly what will come out of it. And you'll see what I mean uh, further in the discussion. And also another important part of the reproductive revolution is that it can't really be a revolution if it's not available to everybody. So making reproducing, uh, reproducing available to everyone is another key part of the revolution. So before jumping into this revolution, we should probably look at what was wrong with the way we're doing it right now. Well, really, natural selection, which is what we all envision as what we do today, is arguably not even occurring anymore because natural selection will weed out those that should not be able to survive. In our day and age, we have the ability to keep people alive who back in the day would not have any chance of survival. So really, natural selection isn't actually occurring anymore. So if we can keep people alive who are suffering, why don't we go even further, or I suppose even earlier, if you want to look at it that way, and choose to get rid of what will make them suffer once they're born? So. Uh, the first part is those reproductive technologies that will allow everybody to be able to reproduce. I have uh, one contraceptive method and I have three methods that will enhance our ability to reproduce. The first one, contraception, condoms, birth control, self-explanatory. In vitro fertilization, the eggs are taken from a female. A single sperm is injected into the egg, which is fertilized in a petri dish. This helps with males who may not be able to produce as much sperm. This is a chart that I found very interesting. It was a study conducted by the University of Adelaide in Australia. It shows the popularity of IVF uh, births, and you can see it's from 1992 to 2004. I want to draw everybody's attention to the bottom where it says $7,000 per cycle. That's pretty expensive, but that was also back in the day in 2004. We're 10 years ahead now. That price right now, with the growing trend of popularity, must be decreasing quite a bit, and which is another crucial point in how reprodu uh, reproduction will be available to everybody. But there are complications with these methods. Complications of IVF is that you can have multiple births, the babies who are born have predisposition predispos uh, to diseases such as beckwith weidemann syndrome. Uh, this is a further chart just outlining a few of the complications. There are early uh, births, multiple pregnancies, things like that. A second reproductive method I want to go over is sperm and egg donors. So this is obviously people donating their sperm and eggs to couples that would be otherwise unable to have them. Again, there are complications with this sort of thing. We might start commercializing this entire market of you giving away your swimmers or your eggs. The third reproductive enhancement, I think, is storage of embryos. This is a great technology that allows women to store their embryos at an earlier stage in their life, which will allow them to have pregnancies later on in their life following a, their decrease in fertility or some traumatic event that has caused them to not be able to give birth anymore, such as chemotherapy for cancer or surgery. Again, there are complications of embryo storage. Frozen embryos have no guarantee of a viable birth. Now, those are all technologies and the methods available to us, but there, like I said, there are ethical circumstances surrounding each. IVF carries, like I said, 
uh, a very possibility of harm to the mother or the baby, sperm donor. It's the ethical debate of children conceived through these means. Do they have the right to know their parents? I will relate this to the topic of adoption. If you believe that adoptive children have every right to know their parents, then it is the exact same thing as this, and you can't say yes to one and no to the other. Lastly, I want to look at the ethical debate surrounding frozen embryos. Depending on your view or your religious background, you believe that life begins at different parts of the sexual cycle. So for many people, the debate is, how long do frozen embryos get stored for? Is there an expiry date on frozen embryos? Who gets the final say in whether or not we destroy these possible lives, depending on what you think they are? And my personal stance on it is, at the end of the day, reproductive methods are giving people a shot. They're giving families a chance who would otherwise not be able to partake in something as wondrous as raising a family, and it is giving them that opportunity. So this covers uh, the ability for everyone to take part in reproducing, which, as it says in the title, is part of the reproductive revolution. This is what I basically just described. But the next step in the reproductive revolution, then, is reproducing, uh, well, not reproducing, producing children who are healthier, stronger, smarter than any of us are. Is this what I mean by designer babies? No. Designer babies, I believe, is the technology that will allow us to have our enhanced children. So what I mean by enhanced is, as I described earlier, they will be healthier, stronger, more intelligent. And right now, I've outlined three uh, of the technologies available in the field. We have pre-implantation diagnosis, sex selection, and the transhumanism movement, which we're all aware of because David Pierce uh, spoke with us earlier this year. And there is a certain project I want to look at in the transhumanist movement, which is the abolitionist project. So starting, I have the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. What does this allow us to do? It allows us to determine whether or not the embryo that is destined to be born has any predisposition to diseases, such as sickle cell anemia, or uh, osteopro uh, not osteoporosis, cystic fibrosis. And this will allow physicians and the prospective parents to choose a healthier embryo. There are complications, though. Along with being able to discern whether or not your child will be born with a disease, PGD can also determine the characteristics that it will be born with. So that raises ethical questions of what is, what is a necessary trait the child must be born with? Uh, who gets to decide that? And then I wanted to do something to really showcase the, um, the differences in what people perceive as ideal. So at this time, I'd like everybody to think of an ideal athlete in their mind. OK, as long as everybody's got it. Now, whatever you're thinking, this is what I'm thinking. Jerome McGinley, captain of the Calgary Flames from 2004 to 2012, before being unfairly traded to the Boston Bruins. So um, this is my idea of an ideal athlete. What does everyone else think? Oh, he's dead now, but uh, Bruce Lee? Right. Oh, well, I don't know, but I, I, like an ideal athlete should be like a jack of all trades. So like that's good in everything, because like some athletes are specialized in other things, right? But I guess mine would be um, Usain Bolt. I was totally thinking Usain Bolt as well. Oh, Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps is pretty good. Jonah Lomo. He plays rugby. I don't really have one because I don't watch sports. <laughs> that's totally fine. But what I'm trying to get is you can all tell how we all have different views on what is considered the ideal thing in our minds. So moving on to another uh, uh, designer baby technology is this thing called sex selection. It sounds exactly like it is. You get to choose the sex of your baby. Now, 
Some of the things that people use this for is something called family balancing, and the most notorious case of this is the Masterson case of 1999, which occurred in the UK. The Masterson family lost their daughter in a fire, and as a result, they were only left with four boys. What the Mastersons wanted to do was use sex selection to restore the balance to their family that once was before they lost their daughter. Complications of sex selection. Uh, many people find it inherently sexist. And if a child does not live up to societal norms, it could cause harm to the child. Finally, there is the Abolitionist Project, which is a subsidiary of the transhumanist movement. It is developed by David Pierce, and it works on the complete abolition of physical and psychological pain through something called the hedonic treadmill, which is this level state of happiness that all humans return to regardless of a moment of pure euphoria or complete disaster. So what David wants to do is elevate our hedonic treadmill so that our level state of happiness will just be exponentially higher than where it already is. So he wants us to turn into essentially people who have something called hyperthymia, which is characterized by supranormal happiness. These people are so happy all the time has so much energy, and the idea is if we can develop much happier people, that will lead to healthier people, which I think everyone in the crowd can sympathize with. If you're happier, you're feeling better, you're healthier. So in the coming reproductive revolution, the idea is that we will be able to use this kind of project to make designer people. Uh, the complications of this, and I believe this was raised earlier in the year when we were discussing with David Pierce, is that if everybody's healthier, no one's going to die. So there could be an overpopulation on Earth. So those are the three big technologies I feel that will lead to making this uh, designer baby reproductive revolution a reality. I want to look at the ethical debates that surround each. Going back to PGD is where does our uh, sifting through of characteristics stop? Are we going to look at characteristics and decide that they are no longer the ones that we need? If we decide to look at characteristics in the baby that we will consider non-essential for now, such as the height of the baby, the color of the hair, no one is at any right to say that a tall person will live a better quality of life than a short person. So if we, for some reason in the near future, decide that a short child should be aborted, that is an ethical concern that surrounds uh, PGD and its ability to determine characteristics. Secondly, there is sex selection. Again, it chooses for a sex. But in our day and age, determining sex does not guarantee anything. What I mean by that is determining sex does not guarantee your sexual orientation. There is the reality of transgendered people, transvestites. So you can see that being a boy or a girl doesn't really mean you're going to be developing as a boy or a girl. So this is a real big problem if the parents and society as a whole have uh, a view of what the child should become. If the parents realize that their child is not becoming this ideal person that they poured a lot of money into to ensure that they became a boy, then it could lead to harm later in the life of the child. The abolitionist project is something I'm hesitant to, uh, to really say bad things about because I personally believe that it's a great thing. But what the abolitionist project suffers from is that it needs to be successful through the use of something called germline therapy, which is a highly controversial field of science right now that works specifically to alter the genes of people who are uh, in the extremely early stages of development, such as the zygote and things like that. Another point that is raised is, will this technology be only available to the rich and famous? David Pierce completely disagrees and he would like to uh, raise the analogy of the cell phone. 
when cell phones first came out, I'm sure people like Dr. Solas and Dr. Waugh can relate to this. The cell phone was a very expensive thing and it was a sign of elite. But now we probably don't know anyone that doesn't own a cell phone. So David Pierce believes that in due time, uh, all these sorts of technologies will be available to everyone. So finally, what is the future of genetic engineering? Technology is not the obstacle. The, the technology required for all of this is at our doorstep. What it is, is that technology and ethics need to meet halfway so that uh, we as a society don't feel that technology is too rapidly expanding to the point that where we don't have control over it or that those who do have control over it will be able to abuse it. Uh, as you can see here, I have a few examples from popular uh, pop culture. I have the one on the left, which is who watches the Watchmen and whoever is familiar with the series. The fear is that the Watchmen hold great power within their universe. And that kind of reflects on the fears of general society right now. We're fearful of how people will be able to use this technology to enhance only a specific uh, group of people. And that group of people will have great advantages over everybody. No one in society wants that to happen. In the middle, we have the ongoing uh, debate on stem cell research. Really, anything that deals with altering the genes and uh, dealing with unborn children is a hot topic. And um, I'm not able to give a right or wrong answer surrounding any of that stuff. Lastly, I have Spider-Man, which kind of ties in with the exact same message as The Watchmen. With great power comes great responsibility. For those who truly do develop this technology, there needs to be a civil duty to make sure that it will benefit all of society. Lastly, what we need to understand where we are right now. Right now, the benefits of this are understood by some and feared by the majority. So the view of the benefits for general society needs to change. People need to understand that developing this will in the long run benefit all of society. That being said, society itself needs to change. People need to have the desire to develop this with the intentions of benefiting everyone. If that doesn't happen, then no one will be able to see how this will benefit all of society. These last two points are a little more just in-depth uh, looks. So what I'm trying to uh, describe with the third last one is this technology just needs to be available for everyone. And in order for us to make sure that it's not abused, the control over it needs to be split among parties. So in conclusion, this kind of technology has the power to usher humanity into a completely new era. But what we need to do first is understand within ourselves how far are we willing to take it. Thank you. So you talked about pre-implantation um, PGD, genetic diagnosis, right. was it? Um, and then you talked about sex selection postnatally. What do you think of prenatal genetic testing? So that's after you have implantation and you have your embryo, just not after birth yet. Uh, so I believe you're discussing once the cells have divided into something with a human-like characteristics? Yes. Okay, so um, the discussion I had with my roommates last night, which sparked a ridiculous long debate, was here in Canada, we look at that perspective through rose-colored glasses. If we discover that a child will be born with a genetic disease, we have the technology here to ensure that that child can live a relatively normal life. Now, uh, take that and turn it on, it on its head and envision this exact same scenario 
in a rural part of China. Okay. Where the family is already struggling to uh, gather enough resources to sustain the family it has right now. What would benefit is that once they realize that this child will be born with a disease, being able to have the ability to abort this child will benefit the family in unspeakable ways. They won't need to spend the time taking care of this disabled child. They won't need to allocate the resources of which they do not have to care for this child. And for the child itself, it is avoiding a life of what would be, in my opinion, great misery. Okay, so what if prenatally you test their, your embryo's genes and you came up with um, that it has, say, the genes for, for early onset Huntington's, which is 100% penetrance, which means if you have the genes, you will have um, Huntington's. Would you choose to abort the baby or would you let it be born? Um, for my personal position on this? Yeah. Well, like I always said, like, we live in Canada, so we get to make, uh, we, we have the ability to care for these. So yes, in my opinion, right now, as I am a citizen of Canada, with the resources to care for this child once it is born, I would allow that child to be born. Okay. Can I speak for people who live in third world countries? No, I can't. Okay. Just because there's such a thing right now in modern eugenics called um, genetic abortions. So you test prenatally, and if the parents don't like the genetic outcome, they can choose to abort it. And it's basically modern eugenics, just since we're talking about ethical stuff. Well, just a quick question. Uh, you said earlier that natural selection doesn't exist anymore, but with the concept of like PGD and p perhaps uh, selecting traits in the future, like wouldn't you say the spirit of natural selection still lives on? I mean, you mentioned the t tall versus short debate, uh, how people want their children to be like elite athletes or um, super intelligent. Right? Yeah. Um, how how could you explain this difference? Uh. I would probably say that the idea of producing children with the best traits does not really reflect um, any one person's idea of what natural selection should be because what I'm trying to say is you will select for a different thing in your child given the choice than what I will select for. If you truly believe that your child will live a better life if they're tall, then yes, that is your perception of natural selection. You believe that your child will have a greater chance of survival if they're tall. For me, um, it could be completely different. Say I live in a part of the Amazon jungle where it's probably a good thing to be short because there are panthers living in the trees well, that can attack tall people. Well, that's pretty much uh, uh, what you're saying right now is that natural selection does exist, though, which uh, uh, sort of disagrees with the, your initial point. You natural made, uh, in the sense exist. that we will still want to uh, still want to develop people that have the greatest chance of survival, but it is completely unnatural in the sense that it's us that's doing this molecular reworking, engineering. If we were to go back a few hundred years, there'd, there'd be no possibility of that. So it's completely unnatural that we have the ability to do this. That's what's not occurring naturally anymore. So a few years ago, it would be absolutely essential for you to talk about cloning in a, in a lecture like this. Why didn't you touch on cloning? Um, to be completely honest, I had just 
a lot of information packed into this one, and I felt that cloning would be just a bucket of worms that I did not want to open up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, I don't know if this really has any a academic value, but me and my friends were discussing this last night, and clones based on the Star Wars universe, which I said, like, I don't know if this has any academic viability, but in the Star Wars universe, the clones are put into communities of other clones. So do clones get to live a normal life? Yeah, they do. Clones get to come out. They uh, can form relationships with other clones. Then they form just separate communities. It's no different than how we have a completely different community that's set apart from, say, a Polynesian tribe. The Polynesian tribe lives a completely normal life in their view, and we live a perfect normally life in our view. So you said um, like there's no natural selection and like genetic engineering may be possible in the future. But there's been multiple studies that um, to provide the phenotype of a person, you need the genes and the environment to occur. So how do you propose making like a perfect human being or like a genetic engineering if you need the environment to, to create a certain phenotype? Uh, what I will go to is uh, the actual article that David Pierce wrote on the abolitionist project he makes a very key point of saying that the environment, although a key factor in developing a uh, extremely healthy and well-off being, is only, it can only go so far. He, what he basically goes on to say is, if in the future we have unlimited wealth, we have unlimited intelligence, we have unlimited resources, he makes the argument that can money truly buy happiness? So what he uses to back up these points is that uh, suicide rates, studies have shown, go down during times of war. The external environment is at war right now. That's horrible stuff. Why would people kill themselves more in times of peace than when their external environment is at war? But like, that doesn't mean that um, suicide rate goes down because of the war. Like maybe su uh, the suicide rate goes down because the people who are in war are dying because of the war and not because they're killing themselves, right? Um, could very well be a point. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would have to get back to you on that one. I haven't really thought about this perspective for... And then like another thing is um, about the like natural selection stuff. So that's assuming that nothing's gonna mutate in our genes along the way. Cause I mean, mutations does happen, it just takes a long time. And that's why evolution has like this all, like long, long time, right? So are we assuming that with genetic engineering, we're just gonna reduce mutation in a way? Um, I think with the time that we finally reach that level of genetic engineering, then if we do come across mutations, we will be able to reverse it or get rid of it. So any other questions? You have another question? Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh no, it's okay. What do you think the threshold is for genetic engineering? So in terms, so let's pick, say, genetic disorders. Um, you think only the genes that have 100% penetrance should be taken out of the human genome by, say, eugenic measures? Or you think um, we should get rid of high penetrance genes as a whole, so it, above, say, like 80%? Uh, I should probably ask what penetrance means. So basically, if you have 100% penetrance, um, if you have the gene, you have the disease. Mm, okay. 
So the lower the penetrance, the less chance of you getting the disease, even if you have the gene. So for Huntington's, you, if you have the Huntington's replication, the gene replications, you, have, you will get Huntington's. So that's 100% penetrance. So you're asking... So what do you think the threshold is for getting rid of harmful genes that cause genetic diseases? Uh, I think for us to reach the level of transhumanism, like David Pierce is describing, at some point we're just going to have to get rid of every single gene that could possibly cause harm to us. Okay, that's very... I feel like that would lead to a modern day ethnic, maybe ethnic eugenics. Just because who determines what is abnormal, right? I mean, say we all say we all have blue eyes. Let's just for example purposes. Then technically, brown eyes would be abnormal. Would that be seen as harmful, or would that be seen as just genetic variation? Because what you're suggesting now is getting rid of all genes, no matter what penetrance they have, that would harm humans. So who gets to determine? that it's harmful to humans? Is it the geneticists that come up with the tests? Or is there a medical board that you think we should have? Uh, I think in, in the future, we will have a board of people that will hopefully include more than simply physicians. Okay. And I think what they will need to discern between is what is an essential gene and what is just going to be one of those characteristics that people would like to have. So uh, in the case of a disease, obviously that is going to affect your living and it would be essential to get rid of it. And uh, my personal stance would be that things like eye color and hair color and things like that, I'm pretty sure this room speaks for itself you can have any number of combinations of those sort of things and live a perfectly normal life. Now, if any of us, for instance, had something like a chronic disease, then that's a different story. And I think that the boards of the future will be able to look at the different things and say, this is, the, this is something that will cause a real harm to the person once they're living, and then they can uh, separate that from, say, oh, he's going to have big hands. I feel like this is the start of a very slippery slope down to very selective eugenics. Because it's basically, okay, and the most obvious example is, not, is the Nazi movement to create only Aryan people, which Hitler was not kind of ironic, but it's the same concept, right? Where once you start getting rid of some genes, so even if you're talking about genetic um, genes that can cause diseases, you're talking about getting rid of all the um, autosomal recessive genes that cause diseases, which is a lot of the population, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, you can slowly engineer that over time by selecting your next populations, but I feel like that's very, very selective and potential to do a lot of harm. Which is the reason why it was raised in my presentation. I, I agree that there's really no clear right or wrong answer to this as of right now, and it's something that needs to be considered for anyone who is working in this field in the near future. I'd like to counter-argue that point. It's just like most genes are selectively neutral in that um, it's not really um, like you're going against selection or going with selection. So like maybe with the, the eugenics thing, okay. for selecting those genes, it's maybe those genes that actually give the disease the small amount, like 1% or so of the 20,000 20, that give the disease, maybe they'll try to um, not help, not like eliminate it, but just kind of reduce it in a way that um, to make it so that the genes that are passed on are actually more healthy, and it does, and in, in a way it doesn't reduce um, like heterozygosity. So maybe in the future, instead of like making perfect humans, just making just maybe 
kind of engineer humans that are just like selecting um, like heritable um, perfect genes, I guess, I don't know. I guess it all comes down to the quality of life with the individual that's born after the alterations. Maybe we can just go into length of discussion of, about like, what we consider normal and not, it's not normal and all that. But in essence, I think the technology itself, the core of it, what we want is just to prevent, like the, um, just get people who are born, who might be born with uh, certain conditions like Huntington's to live normal and tolerable lives. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, is just um, we, we sort of have to define this normal of health that we think this individual shouldn't have to suffer from disabilities from birth. They shouldn't have to suffer from uh, some nervous uh, system disease that they're born with. And that um, genetic engineering should just be used for that, those purposes. And um, the trait selection, I think, uh, is something that's sort of outside that, that realm of that medicine should be. It's sort of sort of a, 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 more of like a novelty than something that we should focus on, especially in the technology, the, um, such a new technology in, uh, today. Exactly, no, that's what I agree with and which is why I was describing to Keith earlier that people in the future, whoever gets to decide on these things, needs to separate between essentials and things like you said, novelties. Is that all? Well, I think you've raised a, a really uh, host of questions that we could wrestle with for the rest of the evening. Uh, but I think some of you have other things you want to wrestle with. So um, I think we'll just close it off for now. And we'll have to thank you very much, Corey, for a, a very interesting presentation. And uh, by the way, uh, give yourselves all a good clap. I thought the presentations were really very, very interesting. And uh, so we have to thank you for all the work you did. Thank you.